Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to today's live session. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest today, Heine Grüter. Heine, a very well welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for the invitation, Silvan. You are the CEO at Meridium Partners, a strategy and M&A consultant. And in the past, you've actually also been the CEO at Unique, for example, one of our identified startup mafias. So I first want to talk about this topic real quick before we dive into the M&A world. What was so special about Unique that gave rise to so many new companies over time? It's an interesting, it's an interesting question. I think uh, probably first of all, it's it's a it's a, it's a it's a matter of timing. So um, Unique was one of the early movers in this digital agency space in Switzerland and one of the bigger ones. So I think naturally people have been you know within the space very early on. They've seen the boom and bust, and uh, through that obviously gained some significant experience about what works and what doesn't work. I think a second uh, aspect is the company was successful because it had very talented people. Um, so that's a that's always a good source for um, successful entrepreneurial um, ventures. And the third one was related to the timing when you're building your company um, as an early mover. You know yourself. You need a very entrepreneurial spirit and uh, I think that's probably been the, the, the three main drivers when I think about it why there's been quite a few companies coming out of the the unique universe yeah it certainly is a, a very interesting and fascinating environment that you built there and if we look at your track record it's incredible about to see what M&A deals like students.ch, Qumram, Infocentric, Webteaser and many more that you actually let as a deal captain, so to speak. So if you want to start with the M&A topic, the focus of today's session, what are the right reasons to sell your company? And maybe also what are the wrong reasons to sell your company? Um, I think the, 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 it's important to understand essentially that if you sell your company, you, you're uh, basically in, in the context of believing that somebody else is a better owner for your company than the, the current shareholders or the future management team would do a better job. And having said that, I think it's not, you know, there's no black and white about good reasons and bad reasons, but obviously if there is a, a clear integration case in terms of creating synergies in a, in a bigger context, for instance, um, or having access to, to bigger clients, etc., um, is, is probably a better reason than I'm tired of doing this and I want somebody else to, to take my job. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, I think um, the reason why you want to sell, and there's literally a ton of reasons why this could happen, also determines what you can expect from such a process. So, you know, if you're a strong uh, synergy case with a lot of potential buyers, uh, you obviously can expect more interest, higher valuation than if you're, um, if you look at the other side of the scale, sort of a fire sale situation where you just look for somebody who takes over your problem. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense uh, if you think about it. And when you were talking about, you know, uh, sort of the, the story and also why you can actually sell a company if there's a better owner for it, there's a, a quote I'm paraphrasing here from Peter Thiel that comes to mind. He once said that when you sell a company, the price is usually never right. It's either too high or too low, because if you have a great idea about where you want to bring the company, you probably sell for too little. But if you don't have any good ideas and the company's probably not worth that much, then you probably sell for too high. What, what do you think about that statement? Would you agree with that or is it a bit uh, too far from reality? Um, it's always a bit hard to disagree with Peter Thiel if you look <laughs> at his track record. Um, so I would say that's, that's probably true. Um, on the other hand, um, I think, and, and, and that's probably going to be a topic that we'll touch upon in, in various instances as we go through your questions, 
at the end of the day, it's a matter, it's always one of the um, most important aspects here is really timing. And you can always look back and, you know, ask yourself what would have happened if and should we have done this? And essentially, um, I think if you if you're well prepared and if you um, execute professionally, you can most of the times assume that whatever comes out of such a process is actually the right price. That's that's how I see it. No. Um, and if you if you totally convinced that uh, whatever came out of a process is not going to satisfy your expectations, you know, there's always there's always a plan A not to sell. Right. So I want to talk about the timing and also uh, the preparation that you have to do in a second. Just before we do so, a quick note to everybody watching. If you have any questions for Heiner, feel free to leave a comment so we can also address your questions and your topics around that M&A uh, topic in our live session today. So Heiner, you mentioned the importance of timing. So ask very bluntly, when is the right time to actually sell your company? Is there such thing as a right timing? I think there's better, there's, there's certainly as or drivers you can look at to, to determine whether timing is better or not so good. Um, and it's, I would think of that in, in, in terms of internal drivers and external drivers. So let's start with the simpler one, the external drivers, you look at the market, you know, we'll see how 22 turns out, but 21 was certainly a good year. The last years were good. Um, companies are buying other companies. There's a lot of activity. Um, the, 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 the overall um, uh, constitution of the economy, despite the, some of the irritations that we have, is, is, is still uh, very solid. So if you look at the, the, the broader um, economy, and obviously also your specific industry, there's there are cycles when things look brighter and uh, times when things don't look that bright. Um, that's the external part. So I think you, you know, it's, 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 it, there's nothing wrong about having an eye on that. And, 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 uh, the second part, which is, uh, well, I think, uh, probably more important is, is internal factors. Um, and then there's, um, there's always an opportunity to be too early or too late. Um, um, I think um, you need to, in order to be able to enter such a process, you need to fulfill some criteria and it's not, you know, it's not a mathematical game, but um, it's, it's something that you can feel. And if you have discussions with people that have done it or, or some experts in the field, they can help you determine um, whether you're too early or too late. Some of the aspects are you need enough track record. Um, it's totally hopeless to go out there and um, having basically no track record, no, no KPIs, no company history, and then expecting people to believe your projections, which are basically just made up. We should not forget M&A is not the same as a financing round. In a financing round, that's totally, that's totally okay. People would only invest in your company if they believe that they can attend X can get a 10x or 20x out of a process anyway. So the details don't really matter, I would say. <laughs> in an M&A context, it's a, it's a totally different ball game. Um, so track record is important. On the other side, you also have to make sure that you still have enough fantasy and upside potential that you, 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 you believe you can achieve with your, with your company. So if you're basically exhausted, if you run out of growth ideas, it's, it's too late to then go to the market. Yeah. And then there's obviously some 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 other aspects, uh, operational stability, uh, positive momentum, etc. You mentioned the importance of you know having something to show, some KPI, some track record. Are there any certain numbers where you say, hey, below these numbers, it doesn't make even sense to think about an M and A or exit strategy because it's way too early? Is there such a, a threshold? It really depends on, on, on the industry. I think it also depends a little bit on the, on the basically um, strategic rationale. 
So, you know, if, if you want to measure that by revenue or profitability, I think it's not possible. There's you know, certain rules of thumb, like if you're a SaaS business and you want to sell to a US company, don't go there if, you, if you're below 5 million ARR. But those are rules of thumb and um, right. I don't think they're applicable in any, any specific uh, case. I Got would it. say what's important is you need to have patterns, repeatable patterns that you can demonstrate because essentially people buy a projection into the future and they don't buy a fantasy, they buy a projection. And that's a clear distinction. So you need, when I say track record, I mean um, not only numbers, but also relationships, you know, simple things like we make 15 calls and sell one piece of software. Yeah. Um, if that's if you have some consistency, then you 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 have some predictability. Critical size is certainly certainly also um, a topic, but uh, that's that's hard to to measure in in in, in clear numbers. I think what's also very important people should not forget is, is the, the sheer fact of secured funding. So sometimes I see situations where people say, you know, we'll run out of cash six months from now, so, so maybe we should better sell. <laughs> um, that's, that's bad timing. You need to make sure whether it's through financing rounds or company already being profitable, that you don't run out of cash during the process because it just puts you put you under time pressure, something you really want to avoid. Yeah. Then, you know, you mentioned one thing that you have to have that predictability. So to also add value to the company that might eventually buy you. So what are the different options that I can choose from for my M&A strategy or ask differently? What are the reasons why a, a different company, another company should buy my company? Um, it's really... I mean, you have a whole set of 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 um, of motifs. It can go from, um, let's say, in an extreme case, pure IP situation. You have developed something that's just very important, uh, know-how, protectable IP. Um, company has no revenue, has no profitability. I mean, something, a typical case you would see in the, in the, in the, in the biotech space, for instance, in yeah. Switzerland. On the other hand, um, you see, you know, in a, in a, in a much more mature case, it's, it's really, it really boils down to numbers and synergies and how much cost synergies do we get, et cetera, et cetera. I think as a general rule, um, it's important in the situation to really put yourself in the shoes of, of, of the potential buyer. Um, I think one mistake uh, to avoid is to project your thinking too much into the buyer's uh, mind. Um, you know, of course you have to think about, you know, what, what would they do with our company? How could they create uh, additional value? But I think it's also, um, there's a danger to draw premature conclusions about that. And I think in the process, in an M&A process, one of the challenges is to balance sort of telling a story and leaving enough room for some fantasy for potential buyers to come up with their own reasoning behind an acquisition. Yeah, that sounds like a not so easy balance to strike. That is, um, in fact, not that easy. But um, when you when you think about the, uh, the sort of the core elements, what you're doing in presenting in, in, at least in an initial phase before you probably get into deeper conversations with potential buyers, it's really about facts and figures. Um, it's not, it, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a substantial marketing part to an M&A uh, uh, process, no question about it, but uh, people should not be naive. At the end of the day, it really boils down to facts and figures. And um, those are what they are. And you can always, you know, um, think, be a bit more intelligent or creative about what KPIs, for instance, to show, what to leave out. 
But the most, I think that the best thing to do is to really, again, put yourself in the shoes of a potential buyer. Beauty is always in the eyes of the beholder. And, you know, nobody's perfect. And even if some of the figures you show are not that great, if you have an explanation for that, I think it's always, it adds credibility to your story. Yeah. I also want to pause here and answer some questions that we already got from the audience. So here one, I think that is a good fit for the topic we're talking about right now is from Maximilian. He asks from experience for a startup willing to be sold, would you recommend to try to get a deal while growth momentum is high, but with limited revenues, or would it be worth waiting to increase revenues to a certain point, but taking the risk of the growth slowing down? In general, um i think if you know it comes down to the to the to the timing aspect that we have touched upon i think if you're if you just if you don't have any momentum you don't have a you know a customer base that's big enough so you can draw some conclusions from it um it's just too early so i think if you're you know anybody can Anybody can, can, can go to the market and say, yesterday we had one client, today we have two, so we, have we double our clients every, uh, every day. You know, this is, uh, this is unfortunately not how buyers think. So I would be, I would put, I would, I would try to get some uh, critical size before I go to the market, even if your growth is slowing down a little bit. Uh, just a quick shout out from Raphael. He says you're crushing it, Heiner. He likes what you're talking about. <laughs> um, next question that we got here. I think this is also very interesting. So due to privacy reasons, you can't see it's from Mark Schuster. Um, he's with UiPath, a very interesting SaaS startup. How do you see Switzerland compared to Europe startups in terms of M&A for SaaS companies? And also, what sector do you see most growing? I think that's a really interesting sort of macro perspective to get your thoughts on. Well, I think um, if you look at the dynamics in Switzerland, it's just pretty breathtaking. Um, I've been in the, let's say, in the startup ecosystem for um, decades now, unfortunately, I have to say decades. And... The, the development the market has taken in terms of um, financing facilities, in terms of teams, I think it's pretty amazing. And one thing that I always thought was um, was a bit sad about Switzerland was that a lot of the startups that I had seen or, or, or smaller companies, their focus was really on the Swiss market, maybe Germany, but they never had sort of a, a more at least European footprint in mind. Now. It's difficult because all, you know, expanding into other countries is difficult. But Switzerland is so an unusual market that it just, it's just a bad representation of a potential um, international company. Just because you're successful in Switzerland, that doesn't say a lot about your ex expansion potential. So I think Switzerland is really catching up. I think Germany is probably still a bit ahead. But also, if you see the quality of teams, um, people with experience, people that have failed and tried again, which is uh, always, you know, nobody wants to fail, but it certainly there's there's uh, steep learning curves in, in involved in that. So I think that uh, uh, Switzerland is more and more becoming an interesting uh, interesting place also for M and A. Now, in terms of SaaS startups. Um, which uh, which uh, the user is asking here specifically. I think the great thing here is you don't really need a local presence. Um, SaaS, SaaS is, is typically sold or more and more sold remotely. So I think it's actually Switzerland is, a, is, is, is certainly a good place to start a SaaS company. Absolutely. Thank you for your, uh, your thoughts on this. So I now want to go back um, to, we talked about the timing and also sort of the prep work in terms of uh, what milestones, what KPI should you focus on? Now I want to talk about the outreach and the initial interest. So once you're ready, you say, hey, I, I am at the stage where it actually makes sense to start uh, an M&A process. 
how do we get in touch with potential buyers? What happens at that stage and how do you actually find them? Well, that's a miracle. That's it's all magic. No, seriously. I mean, it's, I always say, you know, in, 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 if in the bigger picture, these, these processes look pretty standardized and they are, in fact, there's clear faces. Um, in practical terms, they tend to turn out a bit chaotic every once in a while. <laughs> I think that's sort of the challenge to, to, to manage that over time. So it all starts with, on, on, or I should also add that you need to be, um, fortunately, there's a good word now for this. You need to be agile. So, you know, you, basically we can say, what do you need to, 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 to get to a, a, a let's say, a, a, a substantiated discussion with a potential buyer? You need um, an information memorandum that basically covers all relevant aspects of your company, which products, which market, which client, et cetera, et cetera. You need a bit of a short version of that, uh, call it teaser, call it one pager, something that you can use without disclosing the company's name to, to, to get a, give a potential buyer a first impression of what you're actually talking about. Um, you need as a third element, a very sound financial model. It doesn't need to be super sophisticated, <clears throat> but it needs to show the drivers and it needs to be rooted in the past and, 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 and create some sort of a pretty a easy way to understand how the company will develop, what the drivers will be going forward. And basically the fourth element is a simple non-disclosure agreement. And you basically develop those um, um, in, as you, in parallel, as you start compiling a list of potential buyers. Why in parallel? Well, the reality is you don't do this, you know, of, of course, there's phases where you focus on, on one thing and, and on the other. But as you move with the, um, for instance, with the, the information memorandum, you start realizing what the real strategic rationale of a potential buyer could be. And that has obviously an impact on the question who you would contact, who could be on your, on your shortlist. And talking about the shortlist, which is basically the entry point. Um, I think you start with a hypothesis about who would be potential buyers, what the reasoning would be, you know, they want access to the Swiss market and not an untypical motif, for instance, for service providers. Mm -hmm. um, it's an interesting market, it's hard to get in, you know, why not buy number one, two, three in this market and have the footprint. Um, and then you start thinking who, who on the planet could be interest, could have that strategic intent. Um, and, and, uh, basically starting from that, you then, um, try to narrow down your, your, uh, your, your, um, search in terms of geography, size, you know, you start getting a feeling of the valuation of, of your company mm -hmm. and you do basically have some reverse engineering and say, how big would a potential buyer have to be in order to be able to finance such a transaction? It doesn't help if you get a lot of interest from people that don't have any money. Right. <laughs> sure. Um, and, and, um, you basically then iterate, uh, those and, and, you know, at a given point in time, your investment story that you present in the information memorandum, um, logically connects to the list of potential buyers that you have on your list. And, and that's when the, the adventure, the go to market, so to say starts. Is there any certain number that you would recommend to have on that short list, you know, where you say we should at least reach out to 20 or a hundred companies or what's your take there? Does that even make sense to have a fixed number in your head? Um, I wouldn't say it makes sense to have a fixed number. Um, it depends a little bit on the conviction that you have about your, your rationale. So if you give you an example, if you know, there's a company or there's five companies in a specific industry 
that are heavily consolidating the industry, buying local heroes in all the countries. <clears throat> then you probably don't need 50 of those to, to have a success in, in, in your process because you have to assume that if you have a good story to tell, one of these guys will say, you know, we're in the business of consolidating these players, so why not consolidate and, and, and acquire this uh, player? If your story becomes a little bit more fuzzy, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's with, uh, with any search process, then your list has to be longer. Um, I could not give you an exact number, but I would say that when I do, uh, when I create such lists and when before we start, I think a, a, a reasonable number is between 50 and 100 names. Yeah, got it. You also have to assume that, you know, one, one aspect here to add is if, if the, your, your search for whatever reason has some ge geographical constraints, let's say we only look for buyers in Europe. Mm -hmm. That limits the number then uh, compared to a situation where you say, you know, we have an IP case that could be interesting for any technology company starting in the US, uh, Europe, Asia, then by nature, you have a much longer list. Right. You should also keep in mind that somehow you need to be able to then manage um, the work that comes with contacting the people. That's why I say there's also an upper limit. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's often forgotten, I could imagine, where you just think, oh, yeah, the more the better. But then you also have to interact with all of them if you reach out to them. And that's actually my next question. You know, how do you actually reach out to them? Do you just send them a cold email? Do you try to leverage any introduction or any personal connections? How do you then send out and distribute the teaser, the one page that you created to the potential buyers? I think that one one um, important thing here to keep in mind is that um, the market has significantly changed in the last years. It's become uh, more and more, um, uh, what should I say, pro professional to the extent that people have no problem interacting with people they've never uh, talked to before. Um, so it's it's not a problem to to enter such a dis discussion basically via email. Uh, it really uh, depends on, um, or it really it's really re important that you um, try to identify the right person to talk to. So there's always in in in, in typical situations where you have also bigger companies uh, to sell. You, you typically would talk to companies that have an m and department and their job is to look for interesting candidates. So they're not, they, you know, they, they don't get confused just because somebody gets in, in contact with them. <laughs> uh, but you combine that very systematic approach, obviously, with some, some personal relations that you have. Um, and um, I think uh, through that, you, you, you typically get to a, a very solid solid list of, of potential candidates. And in that outreach, what role does the manager and also the founders in case of a startup play? Do they actively send out those, uh, you know, information or would you recommend to go through a third party like you and use your services? What would you recommend there to actually do that initial outreach? I would strongly recommend to use a third party for that because you want to really keep Confidential confidentiality, and you cannot do that if you say hello. I'm Sylvan from Company X Y Z. Would you be interested in talking about a poten of potentially acquiring our company? So, to one reason to actually work with uh, with uh, with M and A advisors is to keep confidentiality very early on in the process, and I would always recommend to do that and then get in contact with those based on a on a teaser document that doesn't even. Um, um, doesn't even tell the name of the company. Yeah. Such a teaser document still needs to be precise enough. So you can't say, you know, we're selling a software company in Europe. Would you be interested? <laughs> That's just not precise enough. So you need to find the right balance between uh, disclosing some interesting facts about your company and at the same time making sure that it's not too obvious who you're selling. 
And I think that's also, I don't want to dig too deep into that, but you also have a, a certain reputational risk, right? Because if your clients would hear that you're trying to sell the company, you might actually even lose some of your clients. So that confidentiality that you mentioned, that's really important to also be professional and don't have any rumors in the market. That's true. That's true. And I think it also says something about the professionality of your company. If you're yeah. being professional with regards to confidentiality. On the other hand, I think you also don't need to be too paranoid about that. You know, I've hardly ever seen situations where I had the impression that, that somebody that was involved somehow abused, um, abuse this information to to either you know hire people away from you or talk to your clients you know if you're if you're talking to the right person those guys are typically very professional and realistically they're also not too close to the operational business so the m a guy typically doesn't go for lunch with the hr department yeah so i would be professional but not paranoid I mean, at the end of the day, you want to get in contact with these people. And if you're not willing to also demonstrate um, some, some or, or give them some information about yourself, mm -hmm. um, you know, people will just walk away and say, you know, this is just too clumsy. We, we, yeah. we, every question we ask, they say, we'll tell you later, we'll tell you later. <laughs> you want just a second, I need to get some, uh, the, 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 I am running out of steam here, just a second. Yeah, sure. So uh, that's actually a good moment to also ask anyone listening, if you do have any questions for Heiner that we should address along the process, we're going to talk about, of course, due diligence and negotiations, but also the closing and some final tips. Please post them in the comments so we can also address them during these live sessions. Perfect. Okay. Welcome back, Heiner. So I have one last question for the outreach. So now assume you made the outreach and you have the first initial interest from an AMA department or someone else. How do you then move from this initial outreach to a more intimate conversation where you can also disclose more details, more information, and also actually eventually enter negotiation part? How do you make that transition and move to the next phase? So very practical. Practically speaking, uh, once you have sent out this teaser, maybe you had an initial phone conversation because somebody has some, you know, first questions about it. Then the, the, the first magic moment is basically that um, the potential buyer would sign a non-disclosure agreement and then you provide actually the information memorandum. Not before that. And that's also the first time they actually formally know who the sellers are. Yeah. Um, following that, um, you get some add on questions that can most of the time be handled or hopefully be handled by the MA advisor because he or she understands well enough what they're actually selling. And so sort of my role in that would then be to also qualify the interest. You know, you don't want to spend your time with people that are just tire kicking or want to, you know, are bored and think, you know, great, I have another uh, information memorandum to read over the weekend. It's always interesting to know what other people do. Um, so trying to qualify that uh, is important. If you have the impression that there's there's some serious interest and there's also a match you also want to rule out um, people that are interested for the wrong reasons doesn't happen very often but you know if somebody tells you it's great that you have 100 percent SaaS revenue but actually you make 80 percent time and material and 20 percent SaaS revenue it's probably the moment to to clarify that and that's then follow up with um um, Q and A sessions with typically CEO, CTO, CFO, whoever is uh, um, uh, can 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 basically uh, give a give a good picture uh, or answer some of the some of the questions. And the goal is eventually to get potential buyers to demonstrate their interest in a in a in a um, 
meaningful way. That means you should ask then at a given point in time and don't, don't get too impatient about it, but you should ask for a non-binding offer, some sort of a written statement about why we are interested, how we envisage, uh, envisage to do that, and, and what a potential transaction structure could look like, also including um, uh, valuation parameters. And that's then the, the, the point where you can say, okay, now I've shown you the information memorandum. You came up with the first, uh, basically, a declaration of interest. Now we're talking. And then now it's getting serious. Now, now, you, now, it, get, now it gets really serious. And it also it can all get, also get very time intensive. I think you should uh, people should keep that in mind. Uh, and um, you need to also be focused during that period because sometimes you have 10, 12 uh, parties that are interested. And if you put yourself in the shoes of the, let's say, CEO of a company, and you're going to the same questions over and over and over again, you know, you start off, you start losing a little bit your, your enthusiasm. So uh, make sure that you have some time and make sure also it's, it's, a, it's also a two-way uh, conversation. So ideally, you find out a lot about the motifs of the buyers, which then can be used again when you start negotiating the deal parameters. If you have no clue why they're buying, if you have no clue what they find so great about the company, it's, it's, you're, you're just leaving uh, potential on the table. Yeah, and despite all these meetings and conversations taking place, you still have a business to run, right? So you have like two full-time jobs, basically, if you you're are still, in that process. You still have your plan A, right? Yeah. And um, I mean, it's, you know, the process is exciting enough that you don't typically get too bored, but you should just be mentally prepared. You know, if you... If you have interested parties in Asia or in the US that just, you know, they sit in uh, California and your call starts at 10 p.m. And if you then have um, no time because you're playing badminton, etc., it's just, it's not, it's not going to be helpful. Yeah. You also mentioned that there are certain points that you need to address in order to reach an agreement. So obviously there's the company evaluation, the purchase price maybe also an earnout period. So what are the important points from your experience that you really need to address in order to be able to eventually reach an agreement afterwards? So I think that the, the foremost um, element, which is maybe doesn't even show up too much in, in, in deal documents eventually, is a common understanding of what you're trying to achieve. Um, because it, it has a lot of impact about how you structure the transaction, what the role of the management team is going to be going forward, et cetera, et cetera. And if you, if you just avoid discussing that because everybody's just focused on the EBTA multiple, then, you know, uh, it's just uh, you, you leave out an important element, which is the foundation for, for most of the discussions that you have. Um, and I think you should clarify that integration scenario from a from not only from an internal perspective management employees etc but also make sure that it also makes sense from a client perspective you know migrating clients from system a to system b will they like that if if you are convinced that they will not like it that doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't do the transaction but then maybe you should not be measured by how many clients you can uh, uh, migrate uh, for instance um so the integration scenario is the basis and then there's basically two pillars one is the commercial terms and the other one is the uh, legal terms um commercial terms i think it's very straightforward it's what everybody talks about valuations payment structure earnout structure how is it measured etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. um but there's also some important um, um levers within uh, legal terms, which probably don't get that much attention. Um, it's about deal execution. Is it an asset deal? Is it a share deal? About liabilities. 
uh, about representations and warranties. You know, something that's a, sometimes it's a bit of a, of a, of a annoying discussion for, for founders, you know, which just built this up. Why do I have to guarantee all this? You're now buying the company. Well, if you have listed um, buyers or buyers that intend to IPO one of these days, you just have to make sure that they don't get, you know, they don't get too much crap in their books over time. So they just want to make sure that all, all potential risks from a legal point of view, etc., are, are ruled out. And one last element, once you have basically agreed on commercial terms and basically legal terms, is to make sure that you have some tax uh, advice in parallel. Usually, tax is, uh, is not the most important element, obviously, but it can have some significant impact on how you structure the deal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think you should not wait too long to get also uh, some, some tax advice at the table. Because once the deal structure is set, it's very hard to go back and say, by the way, we found out that there's a there's a tax disadvantage. Could we change that? Yeah. Wow. I think these are really good tips. I mean, I don't want to go into detail here because I think we could fill a whole book together uh, with all the details that you can discuss and negotiate here. But one thing I want to address is what do you actually do if you have a different idea about the actual price? I would assume that this is probably almost always happening, that the founding team might have a, a different idea too high or too little uh, about the price than potential buyers? Well, it's sort of the starting point to create happiness in a, in a, in a pricing negotiation, because, you know, if you, if, 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 if both parties are totally happy, eventually that's the goal, but to start this conversation, that's usually not the case. I mean, if I buy a, a, a rock from you and you tell me it's 500 francs and I say, okay, I buy it for 500 francs, it's a typical situation where you say, stupid, I should have said 800 francs, <laughs> right? So you need to make sure that you also create uh, some room for both sides to, to, to sort of um, making sure that they have gotten the most out of, 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 of the situation. It doesn't mean you have to poke her too high it's not a game. It's 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 professionals negotiating amongst each other. But I'm just saying this conflict is sort of it also creates the sort of happiness with with the outcome at the end of the uh, of the negotiation. Um, important things to 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 keep in mind is really you need to create the win win situation. So it's one thing to to communicate. I want this. I want that. I want. Um, I'm not going to move here. It's if you need two parties to sign a document, it's you should also spend some time thinking about the situation of the other party. Not only the company, but also the people involved. What what risks do they want to avoid? Where can you give them something that doesn't cost you a lot or that is not so important for you? And that's something that is basically nourished by extensive discussions with these parties before you even get to the point that's why i said before you you need to make sure that you're also in a in a two-way conversation and that you're not only answering questions but um you also make sure that you understand the company in the buying center the people involved and then you need to be you know, you need to keep some sort of flexibility and manage expectations. That's usually part of the M&A advice as well. And that's also a reason why you should probably have an, you shouldn't go there as a principal, but as an agent, because you always can go back and say, no, you know, I need to talk to my client about your suggestion. Yeah. You can really play that good cop, bad cop thing also a bit. So that's super important to have someone external there. Um, who actually helps you to to do it better at negotiations? I think it's also important because you sometimes you you know you need to think about you need to create this whole package. It's not just about the the the, the SaaS revenue model. There's a couple of other aspects which are important to keep in mind, and it's just it's just a dialogue that needs to evolve over time. And I think it's hard for the principal uh, to do that for time reasons, but also because there's no cushion. You know, if I look in your face, you turn red, 
I know, I already see your reaction. And I want to make sure that yeah. I have sort of a, a wall, or at least maybe not a wall, but a cushion between the ultimate decision maker and the, and, and, uh, and, uh, and the target. Right. Let's also quickly talk about due diligence. When and how does the due diligence process happen along the M&A process? Mm -hmm. So the entry ticket for due, I mean, the due diligence realistically, the de facto due diligence, it starts on the, the first minute you get in contact with, with a potential buyer. That's the reality. That's not what you mean with due diligence, but I think it's important to, to understand you're building a level of trust on both sides. So if you meet, if you miss every deadline that you communicate in the run up to the due diligence, you know, it leaves yeah. the impression that those are probably not the most reliable guys you could ever imagine. So if they, if they tell you it's seven, you better check twice. Yeah. If you build up this reputation of being reliable and precise, it really helps. And the, the, the formal due diligence, i.e. legal due diligence, tax due diligence, commercial, HR, et cetera, et cetera, usually starts after you have either a very sound non-binding offer or even better a signed term sheet, which can be much more detailed than just a non-binding offer. Yep. And what are the documents that you need to have ready there? I know this probably also depends on case by case, but what are some of the general documents that you need to have ready and ideally probably prepared before you go into the process? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, some of the documents are actually prepared or at least collected during the, 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 the phase where you create the information memorandum, right? Yep. Um, but let's say you need documents about your financials, about your team, about your product, about clients, and then some more formal stuff like social security, tax, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, it would be take up simply too much time to, to, to get too much into details. But I would say as a general rule, um, anything that is related to tax, financial, social security, et cetera, you should be able to show uh, basically a, a complete set of documents for the last three to five years. So that yeah. comes back to the, the one of the questions, when is the right time to sell? If you only have two years of track record, you know, then or already sounds a bit early. Yeah. Why is it three to five years? Because um, that's just what uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, limit of statute is um, what it is typically in, 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 in tax uh, situations, for instance, for the mm -hmm. And that's why people say, you know, we want to look at the, the last five years. And then right. if you talk about VAT, you know, quarterly statements, yearly statements for the last five years, it's cumbersome. But um, if you if you think about um, entering such an M&A process, um, you should already start thinking also about your housekeeping. Because yep. if you then need to come up with all these documents, um, it's, 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 it's probably a bit too late. Yeah. And are there any red flags that you absolutely want to avoid here? Of course, I can think about missing documents, but maybe there's something else that you can share from your experience. So I cannot say that the, the red flags, I mean, don't lie. Don't, don't, don't fabricate documents. Nobody is perfect. That's the reality. Um, so, um, but, but try to be as, as precise and uh, as complete as possible. One element which people should, uh, people should not underestimate is the share history. That's probably something we should, we should people know, let, no, let, let people know. Um, a buyer wants to understand the chain of ownership of, of 100% of the shares, and it needs to be documented in the right way. And a lot of companies don't have that. Um, and it's, it's, it's 
usually pretty time intensive to get that uh, get all the right legal documents sometimes you have to go back to shareholders that sold and say um, we need a, a, an accession here etc cetera, etc cetera. that takes some time I wouldn't underestimate that that's one of the classics people typically don't see <laughs> and maybe also one situation that I can imagine is I don't know how severe it is, but maybe you see, oh, we don't have a legal action coming against us here in that case, but maybe that's something that might come up in the future. We just don't know yet. Maybe mm -hmm. you have a risk of losing one of your biggest clients, but you're not sure yet. How proactively do you communicate these things and how do you decide what you actually share with a potential buyer and what you don't share? Um... I would always suggest to bring that up in internal discussions, not with potential buyers, but in internal discussions very early on. Mm -hmm. so people should, should keep in mind also when you think about the role of the M&A advisor. I'm like a doctor. If I don't understand the, the situation of your body, how you feel, etc., etc., don't tell me your back doesn't ache if it aches. My diagnosis will always be wrong if I don't understand the, 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 the situation. I don't have all the facts. And I think you should not be paranoid because people are, buyers are totally aware that there's business risks. You know, there's always a biggest client. And yes, there's a, an end date to that contract. And if they're not totally stupid, they will ask you for a list of the, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 percent biggest clients, maybe all of the clients, and they want to know what types of contract that they have. So you don't have to go back, go to the client, uh, to, to the buyer and say, you know, they could terminate and actually they could terminate. Um, I think that those are those are basically business risks. There's some other risks where um, it really depends also a little bit on, on sort of uh, sometimes tax tax assessments or legal assessments. So one classic is that you have a lot of um, freelancers and the contracts you have with the freelancers, they don't clearly regulate the IP rights. That's just something which is which will it's not going to fly in a due diligence. Um, so you better you better uh, make sure that you get 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 your act together there uh, as soon as possible. Um, and. Eventually, it's also a, a little bit a question of the choreography. So maybe it's a bad idea to get up one, one morning and call the potential buyer and say, now we come to the list of the risks. One, two, three, four, five. So it's, you know, if you, if you set it up and that's where the marketing part comes in, sell two, 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 two plus points and, and, and combine that with, with a potential downside, then you know, you have communicated that and it's, it's, it's also a fair communication situation. Again, you know, you don't have to be paranoid. Yes, the world could go under, but people know that. Um, and last uh, thought about that, you should use the due diligence also as a um, situation or an opportunity to, to disclose some of the maybe not so, not so great aspects of your business because in the reps and warranties of, of a share purchase agreement you will represent that some things are the way the buyer wants it to be and if you negotiate that in a in a in a, in a good way you can always say that everything that you disclosed during the, the, the due diligence is excluded from from that representation so if you say you know all all the tables in our office are in good shape. You should tell them there's one table that's broken and then you don't um, actually have to uh, pay if it turns out that if they find out later that the table is broken. So you should also use the due diligence phase as to proactively uh, bring things at the table that you probably want to disclose anyway to exclude them from reps and warranties, which yeah. is actually the whole point. I mean, at the end of the day, nobody's going to believe you that you're perfect anyway. So sure. you might as well just say, yes, there's a, you know, there's a, a we have some damage there. There's, there's a little, little risk there, but uh, yeah, at the end, hopefully, hopefully the upsides will, will outweigh the downsides. 
Yeah, if, very if, good point. In a serious way, this actually you should not even enter, be in a situation where you enter a due diligence if if there's a chance that you're not going to survive. Yeah. So, of course, we will also have a question for Dr. Heiner. When are we actually ready to sign? If, you know, when are we ready to sign a deal and execute it? Um, when there's a share purchase agreement, typically, that takes a few weeks to negotiate that. And it's as, as, as easy as that. Formally, that's the, that's the deliverable you need to, for, for an exit. Okay. And who's responsible for setting that up? Is it the buyer or the seller? Um, it's, I would say in most of the cases that the sellers create a draft of, mm -hmm. of a share purchase agreement, and then it goes back some iterations, sometimes very cumbersome, long nights, a lot of details, very legalistic to some extent. And at a given point in time, people start thinking that they're tired now and all the, the material points are sorted out. It's also sort of a give and take situation. Uh, and then um, you, 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 you're ready to, to basically get an execution version and sign. Yeah. Perfect. And how long does this process, the whole M&A process, as we just outlined it now, usually take? Do you have a, an average duration of such a process that you work with? I would say um, preparation before you go to the market, typically probably three months, sometimes mm -hmm. a bit longer because during the process you you realize that you have to probably change some things or you want to get to a certain milestone. Okay. And then once you have addressed the market, meaning gotten in contact with potential buyers, I would say um, a realistic time frame is between three, four, probably six months. Yeah. You should keep in mind that you need to keep a certain sense of urgency in the process. You know, if you say, you know, there's a long line of interested parties, but you know, we have all the time in the world to negotiate with you. It's just not a very credible, <laughs> uh, credible, uh, credible position. Yeah. What would be a, a better storyline there to sort of make that a bit more urgent? Well, I think it's it, to, 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 to communicate, maybe not too early, but at a given point in time to start communicating what you're expecting from the process in terms of timing. So you say, you know, by the end of Q1, by the end of March, we expect you to hand in a, a non-binding offer no. just to keep the process going. Yeah. Just really drives the process. So it could become, you know, sort of a, 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 you know, it's it's like when you, it's like buying something, uh, anything. You could analyze yourself to death. So at a given point in time, you also have to make up your mind and say, well, you know, that's that's good enough to at least get to the point where we uh, reach the next milestone, i.e., a non-binding offer or a term sheet. Right. So now assume that the deal closed, um, but usually the deal after, even after signing is not fully done, right? So what happens after the closing, you still have some reps and warranties, as you mentioned before, and you also might have to stay on with the buyer a bit longer. Right. So, um, most of the times, um, the people aspect of buying a company is important enough that a buyer would like the, the core people to, to continue for a while, or at least to make sure that there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a professional transition. Yep. And it could be anywhere from one year to probably two, two and a half or three years. Um, it's actually been less dramatic in recent, um, periods, I think, but, um, it's really also depends on the, on your business model. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a professional service firm and it's really about all the talents you have. You don't have your own product and you, you know, you basically buy these people. Um, and the other part is that you, you have your representations and warranties for a period of 18 months up to couple of years depending on what type of rep and war uh, warranty 
that's usually not a dramatic thing because if you've done your job, um, you should not get a problem with that. But still, it's sort of lingering around, and uh, until you know, you still you are to some extent on the hook for this uh, during this period. Absolutely. So I think now we covered the full process from how am I exit ready until the signing of the deal and beyond that. Are there any last tips or additional thoughts that you want to share with the audience today? I think we covered, honestly, we covered a lot. Um, maybe, maybe one aspect that I would like to um, stress here is please be realistic. I mean, there's a couple of studies in Switzerland now about how many companies actually achieve an exit and the number is around 6%. So, um, you know, you should, you should, you better always have a plan A because it's not like the, the, the typical thing that happens. And in order to finish first, you have to first finish. So, um, I think, you know, be realistic to, to get to an exit is, 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 is astonishing enough. And then to get to whatever fantasy valuation um, is, is even less um, uh, probable. Um, yeah. I would say don't be too focused on the exit, especially in the early days. Always have your plan A because it, it could always, for whatever reason, could be that process doesn't result in an exit. Timing is important. We talked about it. Don't be too early. Don't be too late. And if you enter the process, enjoy the ride. It's a, it's a roller coaster emotionally. It, it, uh, everybody you speak to would say, you know, there's been times where I loved it. There's been times where I hated it. I was convinced 15 times that the deal would fall apart. So you're always sort of oscillating between total euphoria and the deep depression and um, you, you, you need to, to make sure that those emotions don't get too out of control and just think that it's uh, given that not very many people actually achieve an exit, it's, it's sort of a unique experience and uh, a great learning experience. I think, I feel like we could talk on for many more hours, but I think we're going to stop here. Heiner, thank you so much for sharing all these wonderful insights. It's been super impressive and also very insightful. So thank you so much for joining us today. And we're super excited to see what other companies you will help to sell in the future. I'm sure there are a few deals in the making. There are. Thanks a lot, Silvan. It was great, great questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So also thank you all for joining and we wish you a wonderful weekend and see you here next time.